Okay, now uh, I think I've taken too much time, so I'm going to invite Deepak over here to introduce our first speaker. So, Deepak, can you come in? Thank you, Preeti. So, I'm honored to uh, uh, introduce our first speaker for the day, that is Captain Shantanu Chakravarti. He is the Global Head Neo Learning and Assess uh, Assessments at Cognizant. His areas of uh, expertise include uh, behavioral simulations, experience design, organizational development, variable and digital learning, leadership development, and LD infrastructure consulting. Some of the very important roles played by him so far are <coughs> Program Director, Group, uh, Group Leadership Institute, Aditya Villa Group, Global Head LD for EPC Major, Head Experimental Learning Leadership Development, Wipro Technologies, Thought Leader for Military Strategies for Corporates, NIS Pata. Battery Commander successfully commanded in OP Vijay Kargil War Indian Army. So he's attended workshops and training prog and programs uh, on strategic thinking, global leadership, organizational behavior, marketing management, entrepreneurship development, disaster management, and advanced communication technologies. He's an alma mater for ISB, London School of Economics, IM Calcutta, MCTE, Calcutta University, Air Defense Guided Missile School, Delhi Institute of Management Studies, Universities 21, and Center for Creative uh, Leadership, Singapore. Some of the certifications acquired by him are, he's a certified uh, games designer from North American uh, Simulation and Gaming Association, that is in USA. He's a master trainer su from Suit of Business Simulations, USA. He's a certified facilitator for Six, six, uh, six Thinking Hats, Lateral Thinking, Dale Carnegie High Impact Presentations, NLP Consulting Services, Howard. He's also certified in decision making from AMA USA. He's, a certified, he's uh, also certified in nuclear biological chemical prevention. That is from uh, NBC Warfare School. Uh, he's also certified in psychometrics. Some of his uh, interests include uh, bartending, uh, barbecue except lighting the charcoal and he's an active quiz master. He also likes playing with the recently acquired automatic off-roader. So I would now uh, request Mr. Captain Shantanu to uh, take over. Thank you. snippets of this 
entire concept. So how many of you know what VUCA is? VUCA, VUCA. Anybody? What, what, what's it? Milan. And I want to give a special thanks to Milind that I know I've, I've been in Bangalore and uh, I keep on tro tripping around and uh, he's, he's quite active in that chapter as well. Keeps on sending us a lot of notes and stuff. So he has a very unique way of asking and seeking. Uh, so thank you and I'm going to meet you guys. Uh, yeah, volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. This is the term that was used in the It's basically coming from the army. Uh, when the first Iraq war happened and General Colin Powell was the man, they coined this word and it's used in the corporate language very far because it's, it's a dynamism, it's very change, it's about change, it's about volatility. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to talk about something which is very close to you guys, okay? So can somebody tell me, all of you in the learning and development at Resume uh, uh, industry, who is the worst patient? Yeah? The doctor. The doctor. The doctor is the worst patient. So taking a workshop for L&D professionals, you can understand the huh? genesis of who's the worst patient. And it becomes doubly important when I talk about Mumbai in Mumbai with you guys, right? Uh, so uh, so that's that's like going to be uh, kind of a, but I'll try to do my best. It's something that you are aware of. In fact, when this happened, I was also in Mumbai. I used to work right around the corner in Aritha Birla Group in Belapur in the Group Leadership Institute. Uh, I was the program director there, so I was working there. So I'm going to talk about this concept. You've seen this as a, a video <laughs> file by Captain Gregory Raman, one of my colleagues. Uh, so it's nothing new. What is going to be different is the linkage that I did. So I did some, I'm an alumni of Howard. So there is a professional called Professor Deshpande who did the similar kind of things. So when I started talking about this subject, I went around and saw that, okay, special forces, NSGs, marine commandos, firefighters, defense, a lot of people have heard about it. What about the people on the floor? What about the Tata Group employees? What about them? So I started trying to research whether I can get some feed. And fortunately for me, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a session on the same subject being done in Howard, uh, which talks about the frontline employees. So what I did is I took the footage of the class. I took this footage and I stitched everything nugget by nugget to see where it is. So when I go through this, it's going to be actual footage of the stuff that happened there from the archives. Uh, and it's also going to be giving you the other side of the story, which is uh, the people from the Taj. And what beautifully emerges is you see a kind of commonality and thread between two these variant forms of uh, people. Okay? Uh, you're free to ask any questions. I'm going to be moderating it, so it's not going to be start to finish. It's going to start and I'm going to moderate after every clip. Okay, so can somebody give me a semblance of what happened on, on that 26-11? What was happening during the evening when it started happening? Anyway, what was the general public opinion that time? The terrorists? Yeah. What happened? Okay, it was, what happened, okay? Fear, fear, fear. Fear? Was it fear? Was it fear? No. Initially? Disbelief. Tell us the flash moment, the time that it happened, started happening. <coughs> Was it terrifying? You're talking of core emotion. Fear is a core emotion. Fear happened later. What happened before? Shock and shock. Disbelief. What disbelief? Sorry? Later. Later. I'm going to probe you guys. Right? That's my job, you know? Probing you guys, right? What happened? What was going around that day? Chaos. Chaos. For me, what I felt was uh, that evening, suddenly out of the blue, it was like breaking news. Yeah. 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 And that shot the hell out of them because all of a sudden, everybody was going something was happening. It was crazy to see those cameras <laughs> on, people landing on Later, the sir. That came later. I want the first 30 minutes. Uh, of what happened. You know, it, it was, media came, the social media, the, the, it was not so prevalent, we did not have so much purpose, and, uh, uh, bandwidth available at our homes, except for David Hedley, I don't know how he got it. But uh, uh, other than that, everybody else was, what was going on the first 30 minutes? Okay, what was going around that day during that time? Uncertainty. What was going on that day? Confusion Every, and chaos. Remember, there was a cricket match on, on that particular day. Alright? 
that was the environment. People were glued to television. It was evening time. Generally, that is the time when you have the office crowd going back home. Okay, and at that point of time, you start hearing these semblances of some shootout happening somewhere uh, near the Taj. And as general perception goes, you say it's a gangster war or something that's going on. So that was the kind of confusion. Nobody thought that it can be a terrorist. Nobody could understand the scale. So there was kind of a uncertainty. The VUCA, the uncertain part of it, happened. It was a chaos. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the premise drawn from the footage from the National Archives during that time. And each one of these footages are hardly 30, 40 seconds or one, one minute and a half. And then I'm going to moderate. Okay? Yeah. More than 500 guests were registered at the hotel. Another five to 600 were attending functions in banquet halls or sitting down to dinner in the hotel's 10 restaurants. Shortly after 9 p.m., an explosion rocked the Leopold Cafe just around the corner, less than 200 meters from the Taj. Two young men pulled up automatic weapons and began firing. Crowds at the gateway of India and along the street in front of the Taj Pond, many rushing the doors of the hotel. In the ensuing chaos, two heavily armed terrorists circumvented the metal detectors and entered the lobby. They were soon joined by the two attackers from the Leopold, who broke through a back door. 9.35 or 9.40 was the first call I got from one of my chefs. And I think some shooting is taking place. The person has been shot dead outside my restaurant. And then we had another gunshot and I said, I told him on the phone already, I said, just close all the kitchens, all the restaurant doors. They were banging the door. They were letting everyone come out, otherwise we'll shoot you. There were a few guests. The the situation of the entire scenario was very scary. We couldn't uh, judge at that time ki what is exactly happening in your time. It was a literally poor situation. You can hear the granite knobbing around, you can hear the gunshot also. We did not know the scale of the attack. We did not know what exactly was going on, where they were uh, in that moment. Alright, so... Oops. Hello, hello, is it okay? Yeah. yeah, hello. You could hear the audio of the video, right? Yeah. Alright, so uh, this was the situation, this is the Taj side of the story. Okay, so you saw the GM there, you saw the backwards guy, you saw the chef, uh, who was saying that this is what happened and this is their story. So my question to you, uh, do you know how many people were there in the Taj that day? Five or six thousand? Anybody else? Any guesses? Okay. That's what uh, we heard. I mean, five hundred guests were there. Okay. And five hundred additional guests were uh, in the banquet hall or something. Okay. 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 Sorry. Thousand or more. And okay. apart from that, uh, you give your number or no total number of people head count. Okay. What was the average age of the people, the staff? I'm not getting in. I'm not getting the. Not getting the. In the command operation that will come later. That's something of my own. Yeah. This is a problem. I like this. You do that. Yeah. I say. Come. 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 This is not the Trident, this is not uh, other places, this is just the Taj. 1,700 people who were there at the hotel uh, who were there, and uh, the average age was between 27 years. So that was the average age uh, which was there at the Taj during that time. And the question is, what were they doing? What were they actually uh, doing when this thing happened? So my question to you is, imagine the situation. It's evening time. People are hearing shots. 
they're not aware of what and Taj, as you know, is a property has a huge facade. Okay, uh, people thought it is uh, probably a firecracker or something that's going on. They were not aware of what happened. They saw some celebrations, and during that time, the staff is on a rotational shift. You know, the hotels work in shifts, so it's on a rotational shift. Uh, they done they done come to know that there is some kind of a terrorist activity which has taken place in the lobby from the Leopold side, and the shift has just changed over. It's a transition shift, okay? So during that time, if you were a 22 or a 23 year old rookie, as we call it in our IT language, uh, who was manning a particular desk in the Taj, changed your shift, or normally you were passing it, what would you do? What do you do? Panic, light. light or fight? Light. Light? Mm -hmm. Who's the daredevil who says fight? <laughs> okay? Everybody flight? Yeah. Pack up. valid point there. You can't actually predict what you're going to do. Because, uh, it also depends on what that person's job responsibility is. I mean, if someone is from the front desk or security or you know, uh, they need to get into action. I mean, that is the time of actually managing the show. I the would tend to have a difference of opinion there. Job responsibilities and charters and SOPs are well crafted. Nobody determines a terrorist attack in the heart of Mumbai happening in the evening uh, per se. You have guest issues, you have issues in traffic, you have issues in infrastructure, understandable. Imagine these guys, they're 20 to 30 years, they are in transition. Some of them, most of them are trainees. Anybody? A lot of trainees. Yeah? You have a lot of trainees, you have a lot of apprentices who are there. So at that point of time, you know, you cannot be expected to see your charter. And, and some of them were in transit in the sense they were outside there. So why I'm asking this question is that at that point of time, let's see what these guys did. Okay? This is the type of this is the side of the story which you would have read in the newspapers, you would not have seen the footage, and that's where I want to because I will be getting the other part of it also. That's that's where this, this session relates, where I stitch these together. Let us see what these guys did during that time when this all things were going on. Am I too fast? Am I okay? Yeah? Okay. The staff of the Taj stayed on duty throughout the siege, calmly frightened guests and assisting in their rescue. Many even came back inside after leading guests out of the building. Members of the hotel's team of telephone operators originally evacuated voluntarily returned to their stations and stayed on all night. They became the hub of communication uh, at that point. They were the ones calling every single guest room, talking to the guests and telling them to stay and don't step out, lock your door. As the terrorists roamed the halls, telephone operators instructed trapped guests to pull their key cards to turn off the illuminated occupy button in the hallway outside their doors. The attack started at 9 13 p.m. Till 4 o'clock, they were answering guest rooms. I think that speaks a lot for hotel under attack. All right. So, um, you saw what they did. They were going back. They came back. They manned the desks. The EDPH systems uh, started, they take, took up their responsibility. They started calling up more than those thousand guests which were there across trying to see whether they are safe, look at the presence of mind. Uh, they ask them to take off the illumination from outside because you know the room is occupied or vacant, this and that. And these were people who were not trained. They didn't have any training on this. You don't train people on terrorist attacks in your hotel management institutes. So they came back, they went there. The idea is they came back. Now as professionals of people function, my question to you is, what would you do to a person who never came back? 
if you are his or her manager and that person didn't come back, what would you do? Uh-huh. Yes, that's okay. that's a typical yeah, that's human true. remains answer. So true. So true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But uh, I would not really blame him. Okay. Because then he also has responsibility towards his family. Maybe he just flight was a reaction. So we can't really blame them. But of course, if they do something like what Priti stated, then that is excellence. But if uh, the person has done this, we we cannot really blame him. Okay. You're asking this question after the incident has happened or at that point in time? During the incident, uh, the managers are the first ones to scoot off. I won't spend the time on the people of the Montana. I will manage my resources who are available at that time. Yeah, the question is not about operations here. What you say, telling me, giving me an answer is operational. So I'm not asking operation. I'm asking you in the appraisal that you do. <laughs> That's post incident. Yeah, appraisal has always been posted. It's called the cascadise season for me to cut the grass. Uh, again, operational response. No. What would you tell that person who may not have come back? Nothing. You listen to the answer? So this is the dichotomy of human emotion, right? I ask you a question first, fight or flight, everybody says flight. And when you have a flight case here, you say I will ask counseling, I do this, I do that, I do this. <laughs> So, Seema, what you say is a very, very factual, decision-oriented discussion, okay? Now, the question is that you will not be able to have that conversation because you cannot reprimand that person, all right? You cannot reprimand that person. We're not talking about reprimand. Yeah, you cannot counsel the person per se on such a situation also. The person needs to reflect the way you guys are reflecting today of what happened there. And reflection and introspection is one of the most core areas of development. Okay, so no matter how they say, you reflect, you have this trauma moments, you have both moments, you have that touch point, which actually makes the difference. Okay, so for that, okay. now we've been talking about thought, we've been talking about that. There is another question which is brought, Black Tornado. That was the operation which was named, Operation Black Tornado, and this is by, led by? Sadiq Muni was one of the martyrs, okay? It was the National Security Guards. NSG from Manisar, who did not have a best bus to go uh, in Delhi, and they got a best bus here. Uh, the situation was quite different. You have people sitting in Manisar, and then they are told they have to be overnight waiting for it. Who are the first guys, by the way, to go in touch from the, from the defense? Are anybody else? Who are the first guys, other than civilians, who actually went in? <laughs> okay, it was the Marcos. Marcos and Marine Commandos, they're stationed, they would have seen they cover their faces. They don't expose their faces. So these are the Marine Commandos who went there. They did not quite work well, out successful. So now let's see. You would think the Army is, uh, I, I come from the background, it's very well trained. It knows all the stuff. It's, it, it's absolutely aware of what's happening. God damn, not a single person actually went into a five star to have a cup of coffee before this. <laughs> Right? So these guys trained in warfare, they're trained in the line of control, they're trained in weaponry, they are not trained in looking at a nice looking steward and say good morning ma'am. <laughs> but they are getting into that, they're getting in from a people which is completely uncertain, ambiguous, the city is not there, they are stationed in Manisar or Gurgaon and they are brought into this place with a lot of difficulty. So let's listen to Captain Rabu what he says about them. Okay? This is some part which you would have seen before, but I've taken a slip. They don't go to the more than thousand rooms that these boys had to open one after another after another. And let me put that again in context. In room opening drills, there are two ways you do it. One way is called a hostile room opening, and that usually happens in 
certain areas where you know for sure that it's the enemy inside, it's the bad guys inside. You must have seen this in movies. There's a guy, bunch of guys who line up, they put up explosive charge, the charge goes up, they toss a grenade inside, the grenade goes off, they put the MP5, they lose one magazine and then they enter the room. You can't do that in Taj, Oberoi or Chaba. Because there, in every room, you could have a terrorist. In every room, you could have a tourist. And in every room, you could have a terrorist with a tourist. You got the... How many of you have seen his video? Yeah, it went viral. He's just pleased with one invention. So, uh, please understand, there were three different options, and this is very critical, right? The room is locked from outside. That's why this irritates me. I had digital, but yeah, I know that. So, uh, there were three different types of room. They can be a terrorist, they can be a, they can be a guest, they can be a guest with the terrorist. Okay, and you're from outside. So when you go for conventional warfare, you know that there may be mines, you may move, and there is collateral damage that may happen, which is very, very prime. It's because you just bombard the stuff, bang, it goes up. You can't do that because you have collateral damage, you have civilians. You do not know how many terrorists are housed. Okay, you don't know those deals. Okay. Now, again, I say it's very easy to factually say that they are trained for, they, they are not trained for hostile urban city operations. They are commandos, so they are, they are trained for other stuff. They are not trained for this. Definitely not. <laughs> so, so they are not trained for those kind of victims. There was nobody who was telling them that. And they were launched. Now, why I want to tell you this is, you see the variance in the, in, in the commonality between the two sets of people. One set of people, not trained, they are hospitality people. They have never ever imagined, uh, like in the morning, taking the local say, Mama, I'm a terrorist. Mm -hmm. you are. It doesn't work. Okay? So they have left there. You have the different side of the commanders who come in. They have never seen. For them, seeing an apple which is available free at the reception desk is a big thing. Okay? So these guys are launched into that. They are not aware of what is happening. And that's where we come to the first lesson of VUCA. This is from a McKinsey report. I want to tell you. This is the observation number one. Okay? There's drill with precision. In the army, you have something called as a precision drill. And I, I'm sure there will be people with some forces background, either brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, somebody, okay? So you have a drill with precision. I want to take some time and tell you about a little bit of activity that happened with me when I was a youngster. Uh, I was at posted in the Miraz 2000 base in Gwalior. And uh, being a youngster in the army can be worse than a land, I am, you know, a life of a Okay, so uh, that is how you, you actually are rogered, uh, molested, you've done every damn thing of thing as a youngster in the army. So I have a youngster in the army and I joined as a second lieutenant, these days you don't have second lieutenants. And uh, you know, one of the army commanders who happened to be a lieutenant general was visiting our town. Okay, and uh, I was attached to him as an LO. LO is liaison officer. Okay, so I was an officer, I was attached to him as a liaison officer, I had to wear this red band it said LO in yellow with the red badge. And my job was to take care of his stay, his admin arrangements and everything. He was staying in the number one bungalow uh, in, in, our, in our station. And I was there stationed across. So he had, uh, his wife was from Greece. So that became uh, very difficult because Greece and Alexander is the only thing I knew before that episode. Uh, I didn't know anything about it. But I was there, so my job was to be there, the buglers were there, the you know, flags were there, all those things were there, he's staying there. The first evening, it's supposed to be quiet dinner. So we get the whites, whites in the sense his agenda, right? So quiet dinner is, he is not to be disturbed. He's have, supposed to have a quiet dinner, the next day morning, <clears throat> his stuff starts. Around 21.30, uh, suddenly I see that he's come up, wearing his house gown, and he calls me. Because I'm stationed outside, like my next three days I get posted there as a zello. So when he calls me, it is like I'm getting a call from God. Because a lieutenant general talking to a left, you know, second lieutenant, uh, I can't make you understand what it is. <laughs> okay, so because I'm absolutely out of the world. So I went up to him and he says, who is uh, the garrison engineer of the station? Garrison engineer is the civil counterparts who take care of the stuff, the MES and stuff like that. I don't know what a garrison engineer is, 
there were no mobiles, there were nothing. So for me, you have something called as JWD line, those ones which are battery operated. I give a call to my senior, my senior gets to his senior, his senior gets a bop, 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 bop. Okay? So it happened, and within about 15 minutes, you have me as a second lieutenant and the brigade commander as the senior most officer all lined up by 10 p.m. because he has just said, Who is the garrison engineer? So the brigade commander, obviously, is a senior most officer. All keep on looking in your right, which is there the guy is. I'm a youngster. My appraisal is not going to be different, but something has been screwed up. So he goes inside, and the lieutenant general comes out. And I said, but this is related drill with precision, right? He goes inside, and he comes out. And you also see this civilian guy. And then he comes and tells us, he tells my commanding officer, OK, General Wine Sharma. He says, Wine, I want you to initiate a code of inquiry. What happened? The water in the system was not there, inside. His wife went to the loo. She pulled it, and there was no water. OK? Uh, it's a criminal offense. How can she go to the loo and there's no water? I mean, this is not done in the army. How come on? You can make anything anywhere. So how can you have, you know, going to the loo and no water? So he wanted an absolute code of inquiry being initiated. The kaise ye hua? OK? So then, this thing happened, we somehow managed the Bowser, and we took care of him, the CEO, the brigade commander, everybody was scared. After that, I started doing a CUI, I was given the task. Loads and loads of paper you have to write. No computers, right? You write. Started asking, 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 to mere niche bhi kuch bande the. <laughs> okay, so I was the, I was the junior most officer, but under me there were some people, like the mess Havala, who was supposed to be an NCO, who is responsible for the mess complex. Under him, the Lance Mayak, under him, some, some, some. So then I started doing the CUI, it ran into some 21 or 22 pages, put up inquiry, okay? And then I found out, this general came in at around 20 hundred hours. From the afternoon, every person who was doing the precision with drill, drill with precision, went into his staying bungalow, sab kaam kar raha, put the flush and saw kaam kar raha, went off. By the time he arrived, water was over. <laughs> Okay? So that was the genesis of drill with precision. You actually do a lot of precision. You cannot do something without a precision. No collateral damage. You cannot have collateral damage. No maps, no recce, no GPS, no nothing. You do not know anything about what is going on. RNR is rest and recube. You do not have this facility. Usually soldiers get a rest and recube in 72 hours. You did not have those kind of stuff uh, which was there. And the age of officers was 25 to 30. What was the age there? So it was around the same age group you had these two different kind of people who had come in. Okay? Now, in all this milieu, you have Taj. Right? So, what is the first thing about a hospitality industry? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Smile. Smile. What is that? How many of you take workshops on that? What is it? What, how do we associate a uh, hotel industry? Helpful. Helpful. So it's courteous. Courteous, yeah. So you have customer experience. For them, customer And remember, this is the marquee hotel of the country. Okay? So it is customer experience. Usme, ma'am, I'll come back to you. Look at what they did. During that time, when they were under attack, under siege, and how did they take care of their customers? This is the part of the story. I go back to the Taj guys. We started getting these text messages and phone calls. Uh, there were some gunmen on the loose. The only logical thing to do was to close the doors and uh, just stay put. Malikam came to us and said, we think there's a problem. We're not sure what exactly it is, but I request all of you to be on the ground right now, the, the level of calm and composure that the staff displayed was amazing. It was absolutely amazing because they had the presence of mind to even advise us, say, couples please separate, don't stay in the same place, just be in different corners of the room. 65 lives at stake, so can't take a chance. So obviously we were in touch with security all the time and uh, had a lot of alcohol in the room. So that helped a little. 
<laughs> so the story goes that when they were crouching under that banquet, Etchumel was having a board member and they had about a huge amount of guests, Hindustan neighbors, uh, at the banquet. So when this thing happened, people were crouching under the bottom the tables and stuff like that. So the story goes, I mean, some of you may have read it during that time. There was this gentleman, there was a lot of liquor, she says, there's a lot of liquor around, so it had soothed the nerves, okay? What a better day to drink wine. <laughs> um, uh, so when this was happening, there was this gentleman who was crouched under a table. Along with him, there was a trainee who was also crouched. Everybody was waiting what's happening there. This guy picked up a bottle of champagne or white wine, which was lying there. This, this guy who was crouching, not the trainee, the civilian who was there, <coughs> non-employee, he picked it up. He picked up a glass and um, he thought the best way to do is drink wine. <laughs> so he started opening and started pouring the wine into the glass. When he was doing that, exactly at that point of time, this trainee got his hand. He got his hand. This fellow like, okay, morality says that terrorists attack my wine name. But where is it written it's that you cannot drink? So he got his hand. And then he comes back with a flute glass and says, this is the correct glass. <laughs> That's where the SOPs came. That's where the training came. That's where the etiquette came. Okay? This is exactly what happened. So this is this is how things were going on. Now imagine the situation, okay? Imagine the situation. You recently there was a movie called Lear Job, as some of you would have seen, and there were some assemblances of that. It's my duty, let me do it, and giving it in the proper way. This exactly happened during that time. But on the other side, you have the army guys. So let's hear the story. What were they doing? So I want to share with you some principles that we teach to young officers. We were taught as young officers that when you go into battle, what are the principles that you need to know and you need to use to thrive in chaos? The first principle is that every soldier of yours under your command must know their commander's intent because they must know how to assume orders when there are no orders. And that's what happened in 2611. That happens in every operation. That when you hit the enemy, suddenly the situation changes. That's not the time to be giving fresh instructions and fresh orders. It'll never work that way. Therefore, every soldier in your team, every team member in your team must know what is the strategic intent. And that is what made it possible for the black cats to be able to immediately disperse into three different teams and get new leaders to take on the tasks that their commanding officer was supposed to direct them to do. The second rule is that every leader should be capable of doing one up, which means that they should be trained, as you should be, you should be training yourself to be able to command one level up. So a section commander who commands 10 men is taught how to command a platoon of 40 men. A platoon commander who commands 40 is taught how to command a company of 180. A company commander to a battalion commander to a brigade commander and so on and so forth. The third rule is that you focus on your core drills and battle procedures until they become muscle memory, until they become second nature to you. Okay, so I want to talk to you about two things. One is one step up, two step down. It is called the strategic intent and theory of multitude. So you would heard of attitude, right? Multitude is using some more of it. It is using attitude, but what the environment is all about. It's taken from a good by Daniel Siegel, attitude versus multitude, okay? Uh, any examples of muscle memory? Anybody? Fantastic. You would have heard this term when we started our careers in L&D with unconscious incompetence, conscious competence, okay? So that's actually muscle memory. You know driving, you know some directions. It becomes muscle memory to you, okay? So, so these drills are muscle memory for these people, okay? They actually know ki aisa hoga to ye hoga. This was not there during that. Second, you do not give fresh instructions when the stuff is on, okay? You just go and do it. One step up, two step down. This is very critical for any of the army uh, officers or even in the workshops or even in the corporate sector. If you can do one step up, two step down means you need to know the basic level of functioning of one step up above you and two step below you. Why? Why is it so important in the army? In case um, your boss gets hit, you still can take command and make sure things. Yeah. Work. So there is no there is no option of abandonment, right? 
Yeah. Situational leadership, you need to step up. Yeah, situational leadership, uh, yeah, a little bit. One step on the basic operations work or what is. So if you are head of the department, you need to know what is the deputy head of department's job or one level down. And you need to know what is the deans or somebody like, you know, who's, you need to know one step up and two step down for basic functioning. And this is a critical area in the army uh, or in the defense, uh, which successfully some of the organizations have also done. You were saying something. So, how many of you have heard of this guy called Ricardo Semler? Okay? Maric. Yeah, Maric. So, Ricardo Semler runs an organization called Semco Corporation in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. Now, Ricardo came back many, many years back. He came back, was a 23, 24 year old ch guy, uh, chip on his shoulders. Uh, he, he, he used to run, his father used to run the Semco Corporation, which is a, which is a traditional old economy uh, kind of stuff. And his father asked him to take over the reins. So Ricardo came and said one thing, he said, I'm going to do that, but you cannot interfere in the way I run my business. So father gave it away. So now there, he's written a book called Maverick, uh, which is very famous. And I'll tell you about two things that he did. And this is very, very critical to one step up, two step down. One of them being that one organization where everybody was allowed to ask for the pay they wanted. So you go there and you say, I want, this should be my CTC. And the company team gives it to you. No problem. You can decide your pay. Okay? But only one thumb rule. Whatever the pay, into 6x. They have very clear matrices. So if I am drawing 1000 bucks, I need to give back 6000 bucks. So there have been documented cases where people have come back after the pay cycle and said, Sir, I <laughs> Okay? So this is one. Second, he said, he introduced something called as JL. What is JL? JL is jaundice leave. Now when you have jaundice, you have 21 days of rest. Okay? <clears throat> jaundice leave was given by Ricardo himself to his direct reports. And their direct reports to their direct reports and their direct reports to their direct reports in the same spot. Now what happened is, suppose she happens to be my direct report, I may suddenly come up to her and say, here it is, this is your air tickets, this is the holiday, 21 days, I don't want to see your face in the office. Ah, oh, she says, yeah? Fantastic. Fantastic. This is exactly what they used to do. They used to feel very happy. 21 days ka chutti. But, but, if I find you have sent a mail, a WhatsApp, or whatever they had, they had those days, a mail, a telephone call, anything to do with anyone in Senko, you'll get fired. Okay, you cannot be in touch direct or indirect with anybody from your team or peer or co-workers or anybody. You have to go and leave now. You cannot even go and touch your stuff. You think what happened? There have been documented cases where vice president procurement is walking and Ricardo is walking and said, Are bhago bhago chutti de dekha. <laughs> That's where one step up, two step down. Okay? You need to know why I'm giving you these angles is this is the other side of how in organizations you have use cases, test cases which have been used from this world. Okay? Let's go back to our lady and talk about job versus role. There was a job, said job dictionary. There is also a role. What do you think is a superset? What is a job? What is a role? Okay. What's your name, ma'am? Reeti. Reeti, you are explaining this to a five year old. Yeah. Now tell me. What do you want? What is the job? What is the role? And I'm a five year old. How old are you? Five year old. <laughs> Can I try? Yep. So a job is what you would, you paid to do. Uh, once in a month. Pay to do. Okay. Pay to do. Okay. Whereas your role may or may not have anything to do with the money, is what do you do? So, for example, as a trainer, I help people grow in areas of pre-identified uh, 
areas of improvement. However, as a trainer, my job is to make sure that the trainee learns. I still not got the answer. One thing is, uh, no offense meant, but I stopped using the word trainer many years back. I know. <laughs> Trainers are used in circuses. They make the lion sit from under. Okay, animals <laughs> will Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Millinth, Paak Saal Ka Baccha Hu, Mujhe Samjhao What Is A Job, What Is A Role. Okay, yes, I, I, I think I think Deepak had, he spoke a lot about me, I need to give back to him. Yeah. Sir, so basically, for example, you're a five-year-old and I'm a father, so I'll be expecting my Wow! <laughs> 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 okay, yes, last one. I'm, what is the time? 11, 10, Benita? Okay, yes. It's probably the difference between what you should do and what you want to do. What you do and what you're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> India produces the maximum number of politicians. No doubt they come from the grassroots. <laughs> okay, all right. Very simply, a job versus role, there is a debate. A job is craft. Job is something that you do, okay? So job is of a child doing his own. A role is being a good human being. All right. Now, all of you would have seen this new ad of Air uh, Ariel about this woman. Okay, and that's the role. That's the role. The jobs is what she's doing there. Okay. So you need to understand. So a lady, for me, a working woman, is a classic example, at least in India to a large extent, who dons these different roles along with the different jobs that you have. So when you said counseling, that's a role. The job is craft. Okay? The role versus the job is a diversion. Now what you need to do is you need to be very clear on what is the role that you're playing at that point of time. You play a mother, you play a lover, you play a wife, you play a daughter-in-law, you play a CEO. CEO, and you also have an Indra Nunu who says that I didn't get it all. If you remember her statement when she did. So this is the difference dichotomy between a job versus a role. And let's see, what do you think this display people are displaying? The job was the flute class, sir. This is the correct class. That's the job. The role was getting back in spite of thought. Though it was not crafted anywhere. Today we are sitting in the classroom in an AC environment talking about what happened. But that's the role. All of you need to understand the difference between that. Let's see what these guys did. And in a way, because I was there, I was looking after the function, I was in, I was responsible. I could have been the youngest in the room, and I know at one point in time I was the youngest in the room, but uh, I was still doing my job. The easiest thing for our staff to do at that point in time was to drop whatever they were doing and run out of the hotel. Not one did that. Not one. Oh, I come from an army background. Not myself, but my father, who was a, he retired as a general in the army. And he was, often used to say, when I was even appointed here as a general manager, he used to often tell me that you are not like the captain of, captain of the ship. And I think that's the way you think. That, that you, are the, you are the captain of the ship, and uh, if the, you have to be the last one to leave. And if it sinks, you sink with it. kitchen brigade uh, decided that it looked like a lull in the sink and they could be taken out from the back of the kitchen through the fire exit to the back road and our chefs had formed a human chain to escort people in the darkness down those stairs and as hundreds of them were being evacuated somehow two of those terrorists got to know that this was happening and the terrorists arrived there and saw these uh, chefs lined up herding people away and there was mayhem. They cut loose and that's where we lost uh, we lost our biggest numbers there. Uh, we had five or six of our chefs gunned down, but they took the bullets. So that they risk their lives in just making sure they get to the safe. 
I don't think we would have made it out of the hotel without the, the support, the assurance, the constant, um, you know, service orientation that the staff provided, without doubt, which is why we will continue to be so grateful to them. I can't explain it. There were no manuals, there were no uh, instructions for what should be done in those circumstances. And so what seems to have happened is individuals from the waiters to the managers of the restaurants all had this uh, goal of uh, let's get the guests to safety. So you would have seen the semblance of what these guys were doing. They were absolutely def defining their roles. They were defining their roles that they were playing. There were no manuals, there were nothing. In fact, there was something called as service before. This is book of observation leadership number two, three, is abandoning is not an option. Now, I will not go into the details of some of the evidence of Battle of Nongemala in the army, the Taj here, uh, which is evidence of how people displayed the role. But with this, I would want you and challenge you people to think of a different form, and if you can recognize this gentleman. Anybody knows him? Difficult. Okay, his name is Jean Lee Suk. He was the captain of the Korean vessel which sank and he jumped off with his crew first. 300 odd people died. That is where the role goes wrong. You go down with the ship. And when now you see it in semblance with what happened now, you think that he is the most distasteful person we can ever see. He abandoned. Abandonment is not an option. Okay, it's not an option. So he's the one who actually jumped off. There was a court case against him. But this is how it is. So different forms. Like I said, the situation, same situation, ship was sinking, and he and his crew jumped off first. And they were saved. They survived, but the others died. Okay? An example of how our role went wrong. Let's go ahead. This is the combat drill which continues on the other side. What are mistakes of permanent? We don't have the luxury of coming back and saying, you know, this quarter we lost a little bit of results, we'll make it up in the next quarter. It doesn't work that way. We make a widow in this quarter, she remains a widow for the rest of her life. Our mistakes come home in body bags. The third thing, fourth thing, is that we have really no material incentive that we can offer to our troops. We have to take them into battle without ESOPs, pay hikes, employee of the month, any one of those jamburis that a lot of corporates and many of you will soon be offered as incentives to accomplish your mission. And we know from day one that no plan, no matter how carefully it is laid, no plan will survive the first contact with enemy. Because the moment you contact enemy, all your plans go for a six. So he has spoken about there was no material incentives. Mistakes are permanent. Book observation number four. Mistakes are permanent. Uh, belongingness of the energy or ownership of, of the nishan, that's what they call it, okay? ownership of the brand, ownership of this what you're wearing, how do you own this brand, uh, you can make badges, you can live badges, you can have people, but what is the ownership of what you display, so this is what exactly was being displayed, uh, last one, team excellence over individual brilliance, so there is a term which I use, vital few versus trivial many, identify the vital few versus the trivial many in a VUCA environment, that's going to take you ahead. Now, having said that, I'm going to show you another picture. This you would not have seen, or some of you would have seen because I wrote about it in, in, in WhatsApp uh, in that LED chapter, so I don't know. The, 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 what does this, what do you think about this picture? Tell me. Okay. Okay. Why I'm getting, I'm going to go again, job as the role. Okay, anybody else? Quickly. Okay, I'll quickly go. This gentleman was in the 9-11 attacks. As you see, he's an Indian. Okay, uh, he was in the 9-11 attacks. When he heard of the confusion, he went to the, uh, you know, the trade tower and he tried to get into to rescue people. The Homeland Security in the US asked him whether he was trained. Okay, and uh, Unlike our fishermen who do all the saving when people drown, they they have some processes to do the saving. So when he started going inside, uh, he said, no, he's not trained. But then in that case, sir, you cannot go inside. You need to be outside. 
So he wanted to help, but he could not because he was not trained. So he took a piece of paper, he scribbled O positive on it. And he stood there trying to tell people that he's O positive. Anybody needs blood, he's ready to donate. And what you see on the left side is his employee ID. He is the vice president with us in Cognizant. Okay, so this guy's name is Frank Anthony. He's based in New York. Now, what basically what happened is last year when the museum opened, one of his friends went to the museum. They saw this photograph. They came and told him, "Hey, Frank, you are at the World Trade Museum. It opened last year." That's the time he came to know that some press photographer had clicked this snap, and now it adorns that museum. And he went with his kids, and that's where he too came to know that this was clicked. That is a role. That is the element of the role. Okay. Why I'm giving you the various forms of across different instances to give you the observations of what VUCA happens, what you play a role in. Okay. And I, I hope that you're getting a thread of, of different forms of it. Okay. You come to the final end of the matter motivation. What motivates these people? What do you think motivates the Taj employees? Service orientation is written for everybody. Self-motivated situation sometimes motivates you. Chennai floods is an example. Like Chennai is supposed to be a very arrogant city. People didn't bother, but it is played. Mumbai attacks or one more. So you have instances of this which come up. Let's look at what motivated these guys. Do they have plausible explanations for the behavior of the employees? Some of them say, well, it must be the culture, the national culture of India. You know, there must be something in the value system there that explains it. And in fact, there is. It turns out that there is a, a, a value or a belief that says a guest is to be treated like God. When a guest enters your home, treat her or him like God. Atiti Devo Pava in Sanskrit. Other students say, no, 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 it's not national culture, it's corporate culture. If the Taj Hotel is owned by this family, the Tata group, they have a long history in India of very benevolent human resource policies, uh, a, a family of, uh, of integrity uh, in, in their business dealings. It's the national, it's the uh, corporate culture. And others say, no, it's not that. This happened at a hotel. It's the industry culture. It's hospitality. Employees are trained to serve the customer. So this was an angle of what, what the genesis of why did these people do it, okay? One critical fact of, of the culture and in a VUCA environment is innovation. What was the innovation displayed by these guys? Anybody? I told you right in the beginning. What did they innovate on the fly? The EPPX operators. Calling each person in the room and recording this. Take, take, take the card out. Take the card out. Okay, take the card out. So I would go back to my personal stuff uh, because I get to speak today, so I have a little bit of bragging rights for myself. So, <laughs> so this is the regiment history book. That's me. Uh, Many years back, uh, I used to be forming uh, uh, kind of a very slim and trim guy, but anyway, did a lot of it. So today, so this is the regiment history book where you can see my name written there. Uh, uh, this is 29th of, uh, this is May 1999, uh, before Cargill actually happened as Cargill. Okay, so I was going out for lunch in the afternoon. They called me, and my CEO told me, "2800 hours, you're moving out with your men." Okay. Uh, now, for me, I'm a heavy equipment because I was in missiles. So moving out means the first vehicle and the last vehicle is four and a half kilometers long. Okay, so me with 154 mil, and it was like the no water in the loose stuff. I did not know they gave me a location which I had never seen or heard in my life. Okay, and I was supposed to leave them at 20 hours. Okay, so I went there and I started. Everybody was in the afternoon. I don't know people who know Gwalior is very very hot. It's May. Everybody was sitting there, no ACs. After longer they had. And I said, Saab log, line up karo, mandir pare karao, 20 hundred hours, we are moving out. Okay? Now, when I went there, I was supposed to be giving an all okay report in the next 48 hours. And that place happened to be very far. Now, the innovation, what happened is, with the Ming Mazari Union, you're supposed to give a cover to something which is strategic importance. Now, this is where I get the connotation of what happened. This is the Taj, and this is the place I was in. Okay? Now, you're supposed to give the cover on this side of this intent. So these, this was a nuclear station. I would have been evaporated with my men if there was a strike uh, because this was this was a hydrochloric acid which was powering the water supply to this plant. 
and I was supposed to be at this side along with here, here and here. Now two of my sides I couldn't go because there was water. Okay. Now we had to innovate with my men of giving protection to this because Delhi would be out of the map if this was hit. Okay. This would have been 42 days out of the bunker. This would have gone. Similarly, when these guys came in the dinghy, you would find this was the front end. Now, when you have an operation of this kind, you're supposed to give an all-round defense. Now, the similar kind of stuff that we happen to be invented. So, how did I invent? I actually sent two men across to a hillside here with a desi simple dhunti. And they were called as OPs, observation posts. So, they were actually manually spanning the skies to see any kind of foreign aircraft movement. And we laid a line with a dhunti on the other side. And I said, if you see some harkat, like the pizza bell, please ring the bell. So you had to innovate to be surviving in a Bukha environment. That's a critical factor. And these innovations sometimes are not taught. And I, I find a huge semblance so many years after it, because I, I found, okay, there's a similar kind of strategic invent of that. There are these two installations which were there. Now when these guys have to take the front end, which is there uh, from the other side and on the, on the, on the uh, Arabian Sea side, but there was nothing that they could do from there. Okay. Now let's talk about the merger between these two things. So I will be talking about the merger of how do you think they are variant? We have been speaking separately. <coughs> let's see what combines this DNA, this thread of these people. Our troops are transient all the time. Our troops keep changing because especially in special forces and in, in, in teams that are set together for a particular task, our troops constantly keep changing and very often we work with troops whom we have never met before. When we are moving into one operation, another theater, we constantly... Good leaders love chaos. Because it's only in chaos that the core drills your courage, the attitude, the chutzpa, the can-do attitude, all of that comes to fore. The plans, the, the structures, the schemes, the processes, they're a good guideline. They tell you a general line of direction that this is the way you are headed. But it's only in chaos that you can find those fleeting opportunities, you can find those holes, you can find those passages, you can find those initiatives that you can take there and then, which will enable you to deliver each time again and again and again, as indeed the Indian Army has done for every mission that has ever, ever 600 employees. It's 1,700 people that night. Of those 1,700, over 1,600 escaped safely. Only 34 people died. Of those 34, fully half were staff members. Leaders must always be out there in the front lines. Leadership, ladies and gentlemen, is a contact sport. You can't play it sitting on Excel and mobiles or apps. It doesn't work that way. In combat leadership, the leaders have to be out there. And that's because in the form of war, there will be fleeting opportunities. There will be those instants of opportunities where leaders have to take a decision right now, right there and then. They can't wait for McKinsey to come and advise them or look at uh, partners for quadrants and figure out what to do. They have to take those command decisions there and then. And that probably is epitomized by the officer to men casualty ratio that your army has, which is incidentally one of the highest in the world. The Indian Army has one of the highest ratios of officers to men casualty, which means that our officers lead from the front. Even in 2611, the two casualties that happened, one officer, one non-commissioned officer, which means 50% of the casualties were officers. So, uh, you saw the 34 people and half of it with a thousand employees, again a common thread. You saw the officer versus, uh, you know, men's ratio in the Indian Army in the maximum. So in, in Kargil or in Taj or any of the parliament attack, you would find a lot of officer ratio, officer, because they lead by example. One of the key members of Bukha environment is, what are you doing? And remember, they cannot motivate, they cannot incentivize. They sometimes know that you are going to be a casualty. I may ask her, please walk across to the other side. And she knows fully well that she may be a casualty. And that is a very difficult thing. And if I'm walking fine enough, but I'm not walking, I have to be alive. I have to see the rest of the troop. It's very difficult leadership there. Okay. So one of the critical factors of the Bukha environment is leading by example. 
it's it's very critical at that point of time. It can be anybody. It can be anybody. All right. So this is observation number five. Innovation on the fly. Ordering chaos. Transcendent derivative leadership is a contact for want to talk. So like you said, don't sit in the room and expect things to happen. It doesn't happen that way. Okay, again, uh, showing off. Now oh, with this, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a general question. Let's say I'm the leader of, of, a, of, a, of a group of people. Now I'm the one who is giving them the instructions to do certain things. Yeah. If something goes wrong to me. Yeah. They'll be clueless. Yes. So my protection is equally important. So in this circumstance. Yeah. However, your strategic intent should be known. How many of you have heard of the Boeing story? Now, Boeing is a company manufactures aircrafts. Uh, there was a story with Boeing which says that you go and because aircraft manufacturing companies have a lot of ancillary companies supporting that aircraft. So you have across the world, you have a small unit, you must be having somebody down the line who's making one part of it for the aircraft. Right? The thing is, <clears throat> whenever you went to anybody who was manufacturing the aircraft, you asked this question, what are you doing? Maybe she was just painting the fuselage or maybe she was doing something on the avionics. And you want to ask her, what are you doing? She says, I'm making an airworthy aircraft, sir. Okay, that was one line answer which was given by everybody. Airworthy aircraft. And that is what the strategic intent is. You need to know the strategic intent. That's what they say. That if you don't give fresh instruction, no, it is not going to be airworthy. It will fly for two hours, then it should crash. No, it doesn't happen. Okay, it has to be with the strategic intent. There is no negotiations on that. With this, I want to show you one thing. Does anybody know this person? I successfully got meandered myself with the lending professionals by most of my quiz questions are answered. Generally, everybody knows everything. Okay, this guy is Sanjay Singh. Ring the bell? No. Sanjay Singh was the guy who was responsible for the Nestle stuff. Okay, he was a food inspector. He brought an empire down. Now, all of you have heard one side of the story. Glucomin and I don't know, I last heard, read them in biology, after that botany, and then I read them in Maggie. So all the stuff, okay, uh, because we survived on Maggie, I mean, the other part of it, but do you know that the salespeople of Maggie were given reverse targets of recovery, and this was the scale of recovery, okay, they had to recover Maggie from those nook and cranny of the country. Now imagine that was a hookah environment, one product which was giving you 87% of your top line. Suddenly, in her GNOs, no longer sales. If she sells, she'll be shot. It's recovery. And Maggie is sold across the country in the nook and crannies. That was the hookah environment. So this was a story. When I was researching for this, I read and I spoke to the regional head of sales in East. And I said, hey, how did you guys go about? They had to tie up with Ambuja cements for incinerators. Four, more than 40,000 trucks were requisitioned which loaded Maggie's and Maggie's available even in a 5 rupee pack. They were loaded and you cannot have a pilferage because in India may they hoard things. They had to be taken to the Gujarat cement plant and there in the plant it was being incinerated. Maggie was selling for black. In places like Delhi, a pack of 10 bucks was selling for 100 bucks because that was the way. But look at the Bukha environment. Why I bring this story up is even in the corporate world, even here in India, you would have those challenges. Nobody came and thought in the beginning of the year that this year we have to recover. But it happened. It happened with Glaxo, it happened with Johnson & Johnson, it happened with Nestle. Cadbury's. Okay. Right. Now, this past, let's look at the onboarding. What do they do when they onboard these people? Let me share, in the interest of time, just three of them with you. First, about recruiting. You know, they recruit their first line, their front line employees from high schools, not from the major cities, not from Bombay or Delhi or Calcutta or Madras. They recruit them from small towns, Haldia, Chandigarh, Nashik, Kiruchirapalli, small towns. And they recruit students, graduating students, for attitude, not grades. Then training. This is fascinating. You know, you've heard of brand ambassadors. Lots of companies, many organizations perhaps uh, you, that you represent, train their frontline staff to be ambassadors for the brand, for the company. 
You know what they do at the Taj Hotels? They train their frontline employees to be ambassadors for the customer. So by the way, these soldiers, we don't import them from Denmark or Germany and all that. I mean, they're from the same villages and same places from where all, all of you come. They're, they're from the hinterland of this country. And they're led by the officers who are not very much uh, older than you guys. It's about the same age, 26, 27. The, the lieutenants, the captains and the majors are the cutting edge of our army, like any army of the world. So, you would see that the commonality between the two different kinds of people, one highly trained, motivated people, one another one is a rookie, they have just did the job. Now with this, we merged that and I wanted to give you a very short brief of how this VUCA environment actually works. Uh, Your organizing co-committee people were very, very hard hitting with me. They, I asked them for 50, they gave me 11, 10, but I think, have a look at your watch, I'm still one minute ahead, all right? So, uh, with this, I come to the end of uh, this small little talk that I could give. I think you guys got a crisp of how this environment was. I've tried to stitch across various facts for sense. Very easy for me to think about the special forces because I belong there. But I hope you got a sense of how this environment was there. What is Buka and how does it work in different facets? So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you.